September 2, 1917. There was a shocking report in the newspaper today, although Father knew about it last night. Senator Lewis Hamilton, from Illinois, made a visit to Occoquan to see two of the imprisoned ladies who were his, his constituents. He was quoted in the newspaper as being shocked and appalled at the lady's appearance. A senator who accompanied him, Gilson Gardner, was quoted as saying, I have never seen prisoners so badly treated either before or after conviction. Needless to say, Father and Cassie and I are worried to death, but we are glad this is coming out. Father plans now to go and see his old friend, Dudley Field Malone, who is one of President Wilson's closest friends and advisors. September 3rd, 1917. Father took the train to New York today to see Mr. Malone. He holds a job there to which he was appointed by President Wilson. It is a very important job, the collector of the Port of New York City. Father won't come back until tomorrow night. I want to wait up, but it is the night before school starts, so I really shouldn't. September 4th, 1917. Just before midnight. I waited up for Father. I am glad I did. He said Mr. Malone is outraged by the president's actions in regard to the suffragists and called it the great moral blight on his presidency. I love that phrase. How do people ever think of words like that? September 5th, 1917. School started today. We have a new Latin teacher. She seems nice, but her name is Miss Trout, and I hate to say she sort of looks like one. You know, a puckered mouth and eyes? Well... Not on the side of her head, but pretty far apart. The biggest news is that Miss Janet had a stroke over the summer. I really feel sorry for her. Her mouth is pulled around all funny, and when she speaks it sounds very thick, as if her tongue is stirring a heavy batter. She has a brace on one leg and uses a cane. As badly as I feel for her, and I know this is terrible to say, but I shall anyway. I hope this means she cannot tutor me in math if I have problems which I undoubtedly will. I think I am going to like ancient history a lot. I skipped a little bit ahead in the textbook to the part about ancient Rome. We have heard very little from Mother. The one letter we received had been so crossed out that there was hardly anything left to read except Love Mother at the end. Every week, more women are arrested. They are starting to take them to the city jail in the district. There are rumors that Alice Paul will soon be arrested again. Cassie went back to Radcliffe today. I think she was actually happy. Her job as a streetcar conductor was starting to bore her. She is all excited about a classic score she will be taking. She made a pile of money, however, and she says that she will take Hammy, Shortful Hamilton, a Harvard buddy of hers, for tea at the Ritz. Her friends have bet her that he will not let her pay. September 6, 1917. A letter with a picture from Nell. She looks absolutely dashing in her uniform and is standing in front of her ambulance with a woman named Gwendolyn Battersby, who is the other driver. Nell now drives. Not only that, she is no longer at the hospital in Calais, but at base hospital number 21 in Rouen, France. This is much closer to the front, she writes. I have decided to paste her letter into my diary. Here it is. We travel at night to pick up the wounded, for it is safer under the cover of darkness. The casualties are pouring in from the British offensive at Ypres in Flanders. We have helped set up a dressing station five miles back from the front lines, but now that it is set up, we drive the wounded from there to Hospital Number 21. Julia Catherine Stimson is the chief nurse. She is an American from Massachusetts and graduated from Vassar College. She came over in May and is a most amazing person. She has virtually single-handedly set up Hospital 21. When I am not driving, I try to help out wherever I can. Tonight, 64 men were brought in. We first give them soup, and then take them off to the various wards. Of course, those who must go immediately to the operating theater do. They are tired and dazed, and often in terrible pain, so we administer morphine. I have learned how to do that. Yes, I can now give an injection. One out of every eight casualties needs some sort of amputation. We might have to send for an emergency group or surgical team from another unit, as we are quickly becoming overwhelmed with casualties. Today we had 51 men to operate on. Yesterday there were 30, and it looks like more tomorrow. Keeping ourselves clean is a major problem. We have very little water, just enough to get the mud off the wounded. 
you cannot imagine how much mud there has been. We have all either cut our hair, or if it is really long, we wear it twisted up in a knot, the Brits call a pug. I cut mine. It has been chilly recently, and many of us have taken to wearing knickerbockers under our uniforms for extra warmth. And we do get cold, especially on our night ambulance runs. Generally, our route is from between the dressing station that is attached to evacuation hospital number 8 to hospital number 21. At number 8, the men's wounds are first dressed, and there is a triage system for sorting them out. The gas men are driven to a gas hospital that specializes in that treatment, mostly for burns, respiratory problems, and blindness. In some of the worst cases, men are actually operated on right there at the evac hospitals, which are mere tents. We ambulance drivers carry gas masks, helmets, mess kits, and canteens. We have noticed that we are getting more and more gassed men at the evac hospital. I have heard it said that the Germans are getting more desperate and using more and more mustard gas. It is not a pretty sight. It is unbelievably hard work, but it is also difficult to stop and take a rest. The boys suffer so much worse than we do. We barely break to eat, just grab a bit off the mess cart or a cup of tea as it rolls by in the hospital. I hope all is well with you. I imagine that by the time you receive this letter, Kat will be going back to school and Cassie to Radcliffe. Is the picket line still going? Mother and father, try not to worry about me. I am being as careful as one can in a war zone. Gwen says I have become a wonderful driver in a short time. She comes from Bristol, England, and is a lieutenant in the First Aid Nursing Human Tree, or Fanny. She has been in Fanny since 1914, so she is very experienced, and most important, smart. She says, and I am sure this will make you happy, we do not go in for heroics. We are judicious in all our actions. Sometimes this is hard, too, for we must make a decision to let a fellow die alone in the mud if it means risking the ambulance, two drivers, and two stretcher bearers to pick him up. Love to you all. Nell. September 7th, 1917. I reread Nell's letter. I cannot believe how boring my life is in comparison. Tonight I must do a Latin translation from Caesar. I must solve for X in ten equations. I must read a chapter on the Fertile Crescent in ancient history, while at this very moment Nell is probably administering morphine to some wounded soldier, or driving her ambulance through the night to the evacuation hospital, or soothing a poor gas fellow in his blistered pain. It seems almost immoral to be reading about the Fertile Crescent. History sure hasn't taught us much. They say more than 30,000 men have died in Flanders so far, and Lord knows how many in this great war. What is so great about it? Only the numbers of dead and wounded and those forever maimed. Do they call it great because nearly every country under the sun is fighting in it? As if this is some magnificent achievement? September 9th, 1917. Dudley Field Malone has re resigned from his position as collector of the Port of New York City, in protest of the administration's treatment of the suffragists. We are all so excited. To celebrate, Auntie Claire came over with Clary, and then Uncle Bayard showed up. He has changed. He seems much softer, and when he saw how clap happy Clary was to see him together with Auntie Claire, well, I could see tears in his eyes. Oh, I am really hoping, keeping my fingers crossed, that things will work out. I refuse to believe that deep down Uncle Bayard is not a loving person who cares deeply for his family. So things seem better, except when I think of Mother in that awful workhouse. But maybe this will change something. It gives us all hope, at least. There is a committee on suffrage in Congress headed by Senator Jones. He has done nothing over the past year, but Annie Clare said this evening that he is now prepared to make a favorable report to Congress on an amendment to the Constitution. He, too, visited the workhouse and came away shocked. September 12th, 1917. The worst thing happened today. Harry and I were at the Ardmore having a lime ricky when we overheard some women speaking about Aquacan Workhouse. They were saying, you know, there are rumors that there are worms in the cereal they feed them. Harry and I both looked at each other and could not take another swallow of our lime rickies. September 14th, 1917. The rumors about Aquaquan are all true. Women are beaten. The beans, cereal, and rice are all wormy. 
When they have soup, you can see the worms floating on top. All the prisoners drink out of open water buckets. There is no butter, sugar, or milk allowed. There is something called the booby house where difficult prisoners are confined and fed only bread and water. Lucy Burns has just been sent to it because she attempted to talk to an old and frail lady who was already in one of the punishment cells, a Mrs. Kendall. There is only a pail for a toilet in the cells. We learned all of this because one matron, a Mrs. Bovey, who was kind toward the prisoners, was fired. She went immediately to the headquarters of the National Women's Party and made a statement, and now it is in all the papers. People are enraged. Alice Paul has been arrested again. She is in Aquaquin while she awaits trial. I think Miss Paul has been arrested at least half a dozen times in her life for the women's suffrage movement, both here and in England, where she was a leader for women trying to get the vote. September 19th, 1917. Harriet and I both decided that we will write our mothers every day, even though it is hard, and we know our words will be crossed out. I feel ashamed that I have only written a few times, even though they limit the number of letters prisoners can receive. Let mother see their crossings out. Perhaps she can somehow sense through the ink what I am saying. I have told her some, but not all about Nell, because I don't want her to worry. I know father writes her a great deal. I think he gives her practical advice on sanitation and medical matters. September 22nd, 1917. Cassie wrote today that she won her bet. She took Hammy to tea at the Ritz. I have a feeling she might have made something of a scene. Not as bad as the scene she made at the country club when that stupid man said the thing about turning the hose on women. Feeling kind of achy. Can't write any more. October 3rd, 1917. Struck with a terrible cold. I haven't been to school for more than a week. I am behind in everything. I think Caesar has conquered all of Gaul by now. It gives me a headache just to think how many translations I'll have to do. Although Miss Trout said I shouldn't worry, and she'll help me. She is so nice. I want to do well in Latin just because she is so nice. I have no real interest in Latin at all. But if I can make Miss Trout happy, well, what's wrong with that? Yes, I know it is not like driving an ambulance through France, filled with bleeding soldiers who have been protecting democracy. But how many avenues are, are there for a 14-year-old girl who is an excellent hockey player, but not an especially talented student? October 5th, 1917. Mother, Mrs. Wilhelm, Alice Paul, and several others are being sent from Occoquan back to the city jail in the District of Columbia. We read about it in this morning's paper. There was a riot or what the paper called a mutiny last night at the Aquacan workhouse. All we know is what we read in the paper, and Father says this is not the complete story. He is on the telephone now calling up Mr. Walcott and his friend the Superintendent of Health for the District of Columbia. What happened, according to the paper, is that a prisoner, Peggy Johns, a good friend of Mother's, was suddenly being taken out of Aquacan for commitment to a mental hospital. As Father says, Peggy Johns is one of the sanest people I know, how could they be committing her? This smells of something. It says in the paper that 18 women tried to attack the acting superintendent of Aquaquan and the matron when they heard of Miss Johns's removal. It was a real brawl. They quote Alice Paul as saying that the women interfered because they were not being told where Miss Johns was being taken and feared she was to be put in a punishment cell on bread and water. So now they have removed the troublemakers to the city jail. Father says he is going to get to the bottom of this. October 8th, 1917. I have by some miracle caught up with my Latin, but now we are supposed to do a term project. It has to be something about ancient Roman civilization. Anything, really. Harriet is doing a report on Pompeii and is building a model of the Pompeii Forum. I think I am either going to do something on gladiator fighting or the Roman baths. October 9th, 1917. This is the most amazing thing. Celia, the owner of Fritz, now Frenchy. Well, today I discovered that her mother is a char lady in the city jail, where mother is now. I never knew this before, and Celia didn't know that mother was being held there. She thought she was out at Aquaquan. Celia says that her mother can smuggle in messages for prisoners, as well as take them out. Isn't this wonderful news? I am so excited. Later. 
Father is ecstatic about my news of Celia's mother. He says we must invite Celia over for dinner. Celia and I had planned to meet tomorrow at the Ardmore, and Father and I shall have letters ready for her to take. October 11, 1917 We delivered our letters to Celia yesterday at the Ardmore. Harriet came with me, for she had letters from herself and her father for Mrs. Wilhelm. It was definitely too chilly for lime rickies. We're in the ice cream soda season. It made me think of Alma. I haven't heard from her since the first letter. I'd be more worried, but at least she, unlike Nell, is in England and out of the war zone. October 12, 1917 Hooray! A letter from Alma! I can hardly be believe it came just when I was thinking so much about her. She has been switched to another hospital in the north of England. It specializes in gas patients. She said that there is one fellow, a double amputee who is also now blind, with whom she has become close, and she spends quite a bit of time reading aloud to him. She says he is really quite handsome, despite the scarring from the gas. He was a student at Cambridge University in England before the war, studying astrophysics. She writes, It is so sad. Cyril, Cyril is incredibly smart, but now he cannot read his beloved physics texts, so I try the best I can. It is difficult, and to think he cannot even see the stars now. She said some of his vision might come back. October 15th, 1917 I finally decided on a term project for Latin. I am doing chariot racing, and I'm calling my report Panem et Circensis, which translates to bread and circuses. What the expression really has come to mean is those citizens who give away important rights in exchange for material pleasures. A first century Roman named Juvenal wrote about all this, unfortunately in Latin, which is taking me forever to translate. He said the Romans were so wild for chariot racing that they cared about nothing else, or something like that, and they gave up certain rights. I thought I would try to relate it to the suffrage movement, but the women haven't exactly given up anything for they never had the right to vote to begin with, and there certainly is no chariot racing around Washington or any place else I have heard of. Oh, well, I'll figure something to say in this report. October 17th, 1917 A letter from Mother! A real uncensored letter! I am pasting it right here. Dearest family, greetings from cell 21, second tier. Things here in the city jail are not quite so awful as they were at Aquaquin. So far, no worms in the cereal. The prison warden, Mr. Zinkum, is at least human, which is a great improvement over that beast at Aquaquin, Superintendent Whitaker. Mr. Zinkum has actually said that he wishes the police commissioner would allow us to be treated as political prisoners. Father will, will be pleased to know, well, I am not sure if pleased is the right word, that the wife of his old friend from the public health service Harvey Wiley, is in the cell next to mine. She is doing as well as can be expected, as I am, too. I have had a rash on my left arm, and I pick all the lice I can out of my hair. I sleep and I think. We are not permitted any reading or writing materials, but one kind soul has sneaked in his, this pencil and paper. I am not in despair, but I am in a quandary. I wonder constantly how this could be happening. How can President Wilson countenance this treatment of all these good American women, law-abiding American women, who in fact only want to participate wholly in a democracy? We have so much to contribute. Why abuse us and attempt to denigrate our cause and humiliate us? Note I say, try, for I am sure that the President ultimately humiliates only himself and his administration. No matter what achievements are ahead, this will be a dark stain on his legacy as President of the United States. Know that I think of each of you every minute of every hour of every day. My dearest cat, I shall hate that I am missing so much of these very important months of your life. Yours and father's sacrifice is perhaps the greatest in our family, that of the youngest child and the patient and understanding husband. But you both know why I do this. Fear not, I have no despair. I remember the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson. God offers everyone his choice between truth and repose. Take what you please. You can never have both. We Bowens are all truth seekers, so there is consequently little repose in sight for now. Love, Mother. 
October 30th, 1917. I haven't had any time to write in my diary, between my chariot racing report, hockey practice, and writing mother. It is so much easier to write her now that I am sure that letters aren't being censored. I mostly tell her everything I am doing. In addition, I have taken to reading the papers very carefully, so I can report on the war, and also any articles on the suffrage movement. October 31st, 1917. Clary came over and carved pumpkins with me for Halloween. We set out dishes of candy to hand out to trick-or-treaters. I made Clary a crown from tinfoil and got some old silk fringe shawls of mother's and dressed her up like a princess. I got myself a sheet, which I dra draped toga style, and then pulled some ivy growing on the side of the house and made myself a wreath. I am that Roman fellow, juvenile, who wrote about the chariot racing. Father took our pictures.